Thank you, guys. So this story was not supposed to have a happy ending. Big money were involved, and uh, around $200 million, that's how much Orcas and Belugas could potentially cost. Released in the ocean, right? Everybody thought that. But sometimes even the impossible is possible. My name is Oksana Fedorova. I'm one of the founders of Free Russian Whales Coalition. And today I will share with you a story of the biggest release of cetaceans in history. I'll try to put you through the context of this campaign with many ups and downs because this was not an easy win. But we did uh, learn many important lessons and I want to share them with you. So let's begin. First, I want to ask you, raise your hand if you've heard of the Russian whale jail. So pretty much everyone. The story hit the news in November uh, 2018 when this video was released by a local media agency. It sparked outrage around the world as people saw dozens of these animals cramped up in the small, tiny enclosures. The story went viral and it put the issue on the radar. Uh, but, but the campaign to free this animal started before this video was released. So let's uh, go back to um, April of 2018 when we learned that Russian fisheries are planning to capture 13 orcas and 90 belugas. Um, despite of the years of criticism and previous investigations that led to a halt of captures in 2016 and 17, the fisheries wanted to resume the practice. They claim that there are too many orcas and they eat their fish, so their numbers need to be reduced. In reality, the captured orcas were not even from a fish-eating population. They were from a small marine mammal-eating population that has an estimate of only about 300 animals. But fisheries ignored it. There was a chance to stop the captures before the quotas were issued, and we fought really hard for it. We organized uh, protests, petitions, sent letters. Even Pamela Anderson sent a letter to the president, but it didn't work. The captures were approved. So we decided to do something we haven't done before. We decided to go and monitor the capture. They were taking place in a very remote location far from any civilization, and the place is called Nikolai Bay in the Sea of Okhotsk. You can get there only by boats or helicopters. Orcas come here to feed on sea lions and swim close to the shore, and therefore become an easy prey for, easy target for captors. We want to film this process and ideally prevent some captures by our present, because this was not something the captors were used to. And of course, they didn't like it. On the day when our team decided to fly a drone above the boat with two orcas, the captors started shooting it and threatening the team. Remember, this place is really far away from any civilization, and people can simply disappear there. It was a very risky mission, but we decided to do it because it was important. So the team was able to prevent a couple of captures, but after one such attempt, their camp was robbed, expensive equipment was stolen, and all gasoline was dumped by captors. After two and a half weeks of expedition, they had to leave, and captors generously provided them with gas and resumed the captures. Russian media covered this, but at this point we lost the fight to stop the captures. From June till September, 12 orcas and 90 belugas were captured. One orca never made it to the whale jail. Captors claimed that it was aggressive and they released the animal, but it is most likely that the orca died. The remaining animals were transported to Primorsky region, thousands of kilometers from their home waters. They were put in these uh, sea pens that you can see. And it was absolutely heartbreaking to all of us that we failed these animals. We were crushed by this, but things were about to start changing in a very unpredictable way. And all the previous years of hard work were about to start paying off. So here we are back in November 2018 when the world finally found out about the whale jail. 
The news agencies from different countries covered the story. People were shocked by the images. It brought much needed attention to this issue and boost of energy to our group because we failed to stop the capture and we felt horrible. But now we had a new goal. We could stop the expert. And this goal seemed more attainable. Authorities started, started to look into the legal means of the issuing of these permits. And on November 8th, the prosecutor's general office made a historic announcement. They decided that permits to capture all animals that are currently in the whale jail were issued illegally. Honestly, it was the best day of my life. <laughs> We were so happy about it, but we had one question. Why now? Why the captors were able to send 15 orcas and 200 belugas to China before, and now it was illegal? What has changed? It turned out that a small order in the fisheries law that allowed the sale of captured marine mammals to other countries has been canceled in April of 2018, before the quotas were issued. And now it was illegal to capture the animals for sale to other countries. Now all captured animals must be used in Russian facilities only. This change was made silently, but it was a result of years of hard work by scientists, activists, by support of people and celebrities from around the world. I wish I could tell you in details about all the people that were involved, but I simply will not have enough time for in this presentation. So it took a while to get authorities to notice this issue, but now they did. And this was really bad news to captors and really good news to orcas and belugas in the whale jail. In the next two months, the events started to unfold really fast. More inspections took place, more violations were revealed. Sahalin nonprofit organization won a court case and proved that the total allowable catch numbers were approved illegally. But despite all of this, captors continued to claim that animals belong to them. They got the permits, they spent the money, and they had signed contracts with China for millions of dollars. They tried to get several permits to expert, export the belugas, but they were rejected. So captors were totally losing the legal fight. But the fate of the animals remained unknown. And winter was coming. It was a big concern due to harsh weather in the far east of Russia. At this point, three belugas already died. The captors claimed that they disappeared. And we needed to put more pressure, and this time we were aiming for the president. Since the authorities were not in a hurry and clearly didn't want to take any responsibility, we needed Putin to get involved. We made people bombard his office with letters. And protests were organized. New petition demanding the release of animals was started and went viral right away. Hundreds of letters were sent to Putin's office. But in the end, only connections helped us. Connections at the high level helped us to get the message directly to him. And in December, Kremlin broke silence and he, uh, the advisor of the president made an announcement that they know about the whale jail and they asked the Primorsky governor to help resolve this situation. But this was not only what he said. He also mentioned that lawmakers should take a notice of this situation. And at this point, we realized that this was an invitation for us to start another campaign to ban captures altogether. And we launched petition demanding exactly that. But we did it on the governmental website uh, where only Russian citizens can sign the petition after authorizing um, your ident identity with a passport. And if the petition gains 100,000 votes, the government has to work on it. So in just two months after the release of the viral video, things turned upside down from ta uh, total defeat after the failure to stop the capture to possible release and ban for future captures. 
In January of 2019, we officially launched Free Russian Wales Coalition uh, that included different organizations in Russia who worked to help uh, release these orcas and belugas. Um, and we had perfect campaign team. We had great PR group, we had lawyers, we had experts, and we put a lot of time into building a community of people, of supporters. We knew how important it is to work with the public, how important it is to energize them, to be transparent with them, to give them small tasks that would, will motivate them to do more and more and more. And we saw progress in the undeniable feeling of unity and support from thousands of people. But belugas and orcas still remained in a legal limbo. In the end of January, Sahalin nonprofit went to court trying to force the government to start the rehabilitation process because nobody was taking a responsibility. In the meantime, more and more inspections were taking place to assess the state of these animals and unfortunately, winter started to take its toll. Young Orca Kirill, you can see him on this image, um, he was in a really bad state and his condition was really concerning. He wasn't moving much and it was really difficult to see, but unfortunately, winter started to take its toll. And in February, Kirill died. Captors once again claimed that he escaped and disappeared. And this is the last video we have of him. He's on the right. It was devastating to all of us to see him dying and not being able to help. But unfortunately, some things are beyond our control. And people were very sad, but also very angry. Uh, we organized the biggest protest in Moscow with all these people. And I still have a goosebumps from these images because look at this elderly people, young people, all demanding one thing, to free the whales, to let them go. It was a very powerful moment. And in the meantime, public pressure continued to grow. Our petition to free the whales was getting close to a million signatures. High profile people like Leonardo DiCaprio shared it. Uh, 44 different celebrities from around the world sent a letter to Putin. We kept putting the pressure everywhere we could. And I want to say huge Thank you to all international organizations and my colleagues who are, many of you are here in this room for helping to put this pressure on the Russian government for doing your part. It was important and without it, we wouldn't get there. So in the end of February, Putin's administration ran out of patience and they gave instructions to the Ministry for Natural Resources to determine the fate of the animals with the deadline. He told them, March 1st, you have to make a decision. Um, and this announcement was clear indication that Kremlin is telling the authorities to stop dragging the, the time. They, the authorities breached the deadline and came up with the most ridiculous options to offer, to transport all the animals to captive facilities, and most importantly, they uh, offered to transport them to foreign facilities, which is against the law and was stated by the uh, General's Office of Prosecutors. Or the other option was to uh, put them in SIPA and somewhere in Vladivostok, which would not change anything for the animals. Thankfully, we were able to prevent it. And on March 7th, the special press conference was held and the new decision was made. Now they would establish a special commission responsible for the release. At this point, it was clear that release is going to happen, but they put in charge uh, people directly responsible for the capture. Vniro and the Institute of Fisheries were working with the captors to release these whales. And now we had to work 
very hard to make sure that they don't come up with something to keep these animals in captivity. In April of 2019, another impo important chapter of this campaign took place. Jean-Michel Cousteau team arrived to Moscow. Back in February, along with uh, Vale Sanctuary Project, we prepared a letter to Putin from Mr. Cousteau. And we knew that if things will get to the release, we will need to invite international experts who know how to do it. But it still was a big question if Russian authorities will allow it because Russians don't like any foreigners to come and tell them what to do. Um, and I think Cousteau's name made a big difference here because Russian people adore Cousteau. And it was such a big name that the government just couldn't refuse. And if not for him, I don't know if we would be able to bring the international team there. Ingrid will tell you in details about this part in her presentation, and I'm looking forward to it. Just don't want to spoil any details. At this point, I will just say that this was a very important uh, visit. After Jean-Michel Cousteau team left, we spent two more months campaigning and battling new bizarre ideas of Nero and Special Commission. On May 14, for example, they announced the decision to release all the animals right where they are, in the new habitat. Marine mammal eating orcas and baby belugas together. What a great idea. <laughs> yeah, at this point it felt like everyone just went crazy. Like, what's going on? It took them a month to come up with this amazing decision. It sparked outrage again, and we again bombarded Putin's office. So on June 20th, he was holding annual direct line with citizens where anybody can uh, call him or send him message or send him message in advance. And we made sure he received tons of messages. Um, but we, none of us actually could even imagine what would happen next. And the release started. On June 20th, during the direct line with Putin, it was announced that the animals are being uploaded to trucks right at that moment and being transported to the Sea of Ojos for a proper release. We thought it was a publicity stunt, but it was true, at least the first part. The two orcas and six belugas were actually uploaded on the trucks. Um, it, it took them... Um, the release started and it took them two days to upload animals to trucks and transport to them to the port. Then three days they spent on the ship and then another two days they spent again on the trucks to get to the area where they will be released. And this is the video of the release. You can see that these two orcas are being released and they're freaking out because obviously the release wasn't going perfectly. But they were released. Hold on a second. Oh. Throughout the summer and autumn of 2019, the release of orcas and belugas continued. All 10 orcas were transported to the Sea of Ochotsk and released. They were spread into, into four groups and the release was not perfect because Gniro separated the groups that were already established the way the orcas were kept in three different sea pens. They released 12 belugas with them, the transportation was too long and they didn't get any chance to acclimate, they were just simply dumped in the ocean. And everyone was concerned that they will not survive. I was crying my eyes out the day of the first release because we fought so hard and now they were just dumped in the ocean. At this point, we could only hope that they will survive. And they surprised all of us and proved once again that we should give them more credit. According to GPS data that Nero released later, all orcas were going in the right direction to the northwest of sea towards the Shantar Islands where they should be in this time. By the end of November, some of them traveled between two and 4,000 kilometers. 
Alexandra, the youngest orca, she left her companions shortly after release and hanged out uh, near the release location for some time. She approached boats and got some food from fishermen and she got us all a little bit concerned. But later, she also surprised everyone. She joined the third group that was released, the three other orcas, and uh, spent with them several months and also traveled 2.5 kilometers with them. And on August 16th, we got the confirmation that one of the released orcas joined the wild pod. Originally, it was thought that this was Orca Vasilievna, released in the first group, but Nero later reported that it was Zina, released in the second group. Grigori, my colleague, was filming uh, for the Frozen Planet 2 with BBC, and they saw the Orca. And you can see the tag. It's, it's definitely one of our orcas, and later she was identified as Zina. Uh, but only 37 out of 87 belugas were also transported to the Sea of Okhotsk. The process took too long and they re the remaining 50 belugas were released in the Sea of Japan. It was not an ideal solution, but the other options were even worse, keeping them in the whale jail or transporting them to captive facilities. And despite of the fact that they were released in the, in the new habitat, they made the most from it. This is two of the belugas in Primorsky that were filmed in 2020, I think. They are do doing just fine, they look great, and they are sighted frequently. There were some individuals that are looking for attention of people and come to divers and paddle boarders. We try to educate people to leave them alone, but sometimes people do things like that. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, at least three belugas did not make it. They didn't die right away. We started uh, receiving reports in a year or so, but yeah, some of them weren't so lucky. But most of them made it just fine and adjusted just fine and they made this new area their home. After all animals were released, we uh, shifted our attention to petition on the governmental website. It was less than two months, we still needed 55,000 signature, and it took us 10 months to get them, uh, to get the first 45. And no one believed that we can do it. But once again, we proved that impossible is possible. If you have a group of people united by this idea, you can do anything. We reached the goal. And unfortunately, that didn't help us because commission later rejected our initiative. And only recently, literally a couple of weeks ago, the Russian government and the president signed a new law banning all captures of marine mammals for cultural and educational purposes. And I asked AI to generate an image of belugas and orcas celebrating. <laughs> but for some reason, AI cannot draw a beluga whale, so I guess only all orcas are allowed to celebrate now. <laughs> so this story is a great example how good people can make a difference despite of millions of obstacles, how previous hard attempts that end up in total failure can and will eventually lead to the big changes, how much we can achieve if groups and organizations unite and act as a one front against the issue and not against each other, and how believing in something and a little bit of luck can lead, you, uh, can lead to something that had never been done before. And I want to finish at this note. Seven years ago, I came to the Superboat and asked everyone around here one question. How did you stop the captures here? I asked Ken, I asked Howard, I asked Ingrid, Naomi, everyone I could. And now, seven years later, we did it. Woo! 
as of today, as of today, no orcas are being captured for captive facilities around the world. Russia was the last country who did it. Whale gel orcas were the last ones captured, and they are now swimming free in the wild with their families. And I have no doubt that we will see the end of cetacean captivity, and we will have sanctuaries for these animals, so don't give up the fight. When you face challenges and obstacles, just remember this story and keep on fighting. We are winning and we will get there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now Ingrid is gonna take you inside the whale jail. The questions we will do after. Brilliant. Okay, uh, so I'd like to just say a personal thanks to Oksana. I met her first here at Superpod and was in total awe of what she was doing even back then. And um, as I've watched things develop over the years, it is just blowing me away. She talks about the goosebumps that she sees um, from other people, but I get them with her. So, you know, big, big thank you, Oksana. <laughs> So how did I get involved in this game? Well, um, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background on, on how that happened. Uh, I was working back in 2001, um, very fortunately, um, but only for a brief period of a couple of times um, with the Free Willy Keiko team. And while I was there, um, I had the good fortune to meet Jean-Michel Cousteau and Charles, um, who I believe Charles is in the audience, and um, also Jeff Foster. And I think Jeff's out on the water today um, working with Muriel and um, Katie, his wife, is in here. So in 2009, uh, Jean-Michel came down to New Zealand and worked with me on, on this documentary, um, Call of the Killer Whale. And uh, we had a stranding there and uh, we did the rescue and, and we became really... Um, quite good pals about talking about orca because it turns out that orca are one of his favorite animals, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, a bit of time passes, lots of things are happening in my world and I get the opportunity to go to China to see uh, orca there in um, captivity. And many of you would know that I am 100% against orca in captivity. And one of the things that I do is I try and have a look at them in different facilities so that I can get a better understanding of what's going on in each facility because then you're better able to answer questions when you're standing in front of a judge, for example. What I saw there was pretty frightening. Uh, you know, we were in the era of SeaWorld saying this is the last generation of orca in captivity, uh, in, in their facilities at least, and then we go there and it's pretty much a SeaWorld replica. It's pretty much the same tricks, it's the same format, the tanks look the same, it's like transport me back 30 years and here we are and we're in China. Uh, the orca were really, really bored out of their giant mines. Um, that's me just in the corner there peeking around um, and I was just playing silly games with them and they spent an hour playing with me against this glass. So, um, you know, they were still mentally engaged but these animals um, were really concerned, uh, they were really, it was a really concerning situation for me about these animals um, because we knew that they had been captured from Russian waters. I saw instances of things like this. Um, this is dead fish lying on the bottom of the tank. Um, they have divers that are spending hours in there cleaning up dead fish. And why was that happening? Well, um, I was aware of the fact that they've been captured from Russia, and I was also aware of the fact that um, there were rumours going around that these orca that have been captured in the Sea of Okosk were predominantly marine mammal feeders. Now, it makes sense if you're seeing this amount of fish lying on the bottom um, that there is something strange going on behaviourally, right? Because you do see the odd fish get dropped in places like SeaWorld, but not to this extent. 
Now, I had a bit of experience about marine mammal feeders uh, and um, some indicators of those uh, from cookie cutter shark bites from a couple of papers that I had published. And so I actually was looking for cookie cutter shark bites on these orca in China in the facility. And sure enough, I found them. I saw quite a few bites on them. So that for me was really an affirmation that we had quite likely an ecotype in the China facilities that were marine mammal feeders. And I, mean, I was pretty much the only white person that I saw while I, the whole time that I was in China, certainly in the facilities. Uh, it was just full of Chinese. And then I'm just packing up my kit to leave and I turn around and I see this white guy right at the back of the stadium, like way up the back there. So I point my camera at him and I get this photo. And if you zoom in a little bit, hello. Yeah, and look what else he's got around. Oh, look what else he's got around his neck. Can you see? That's a whistle. So SeaWorld had not only transported their whole concept, their staff were there. So this is the last generation of orca in captivity? Yeah, right. SeaWorld, shame on you. And, and the individuals who went from SeaWorld and ran over here to make money, because these guys are getting big money, okay? So don't think that this game is over just because it's improving here in the Western world. It is far from over. Um, and then Oksana reached out to me and said, hey, look, we've got some video um, that we'd really like you to have a look at. And I know that she reached out to Naomi and a couple of other experts. And um, we all could individually went over these videos and over and over and they were really, really traumatic because they were videos that showed these orca captures going on. Um, and then we ascertained, um, each of us independently, that individuals had died. I was certain that there were three, I think um, Naomi thought there were either two or three, I can't remember, um, and someone else thought that there were two or three as well. So I wrote a report, Naomi wrote a report, the others wrote reports, and we submitted them back to Oksana, and she used these as part of her campaigns. And don't think that this wasn't happening for beluga either, right? There's beluga in all of these facilities around, um, particularly in China. And as Oksana explained, um, about 200 beluga have already gone into China from Russia. And uh, they ship them out usually pretty young. You can tell that they're really young because of the gray color. So where is all this happening? Oksana showed you some maps, but I thought I'd put it a little bit into perspective. Um, so we've got the Sea of Okhotsk up here, and then Shanghai down here. So this is where those orca went to. And in between is the whale jail. And remember, Oksana talked about um, the number of days that it was taking to get them from the whale jail back to the sea. Well, it's the same coming down. So most of these animals were spending seven days in those crates. And here it is a little bit closer up, and um, South Korea, North Korea, Russia, China. So you can see it's a pretty volatile area um, politically. And this is Google Earth of the whale jail in 2004. It looks like pretty much nothing there, right? So then we start 2012, 2016, 2018, and you can see it's getting bigger. Um, things are changing. They've got enclosed facilities as well. Now, there was a paper that came out in 2021, and um, it's by a Russian team. And in it, I found this little nugget that really just shocked me, because I was unaware that 31 orca had been captured. Now, remember, there'd been three killed in the report from the video that we had, but that was the only one that had been documented. The rest of these, we have no idea how many animals died during this process. Why? This is China, okay? Now, Naomi is part of the Cetacean Alliance over there, um, and she'll be able to give you some more updated figures, but as of 2019, approximately 100 facilities. 96. That, 96 at the moment, okay, cool. Not cool, but thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so 96 facilities. This is why 200 belugas can disappear into there and we don't hear about it. So then in January 2019, Oksana explained to you that she was um, forming this coalition. And they reached out to me again and told me about the whale jail. And I was very concerned. And I said, look, if there's anything that I can do to help, 
put my name forward for anything. I don't care if you need to get me on a plane, I'll go and talk to Putin himself. Just, I'll do it, right? So at that stage, um, Oksana's team and all of the public pressure had managed to get the scientists um, in Russia, Russian scientists, to go in there and have a look what was going on with these animals. Quote, unquote, independent scientists. Okay, but still, Russians and scientists. They produced a whole lot of information, all in Russian, um, but with the help of Oksana's boyfriend and some other translators, we managed to get a lot of the stuff translated and we could really begin to understand what was going on. So there were four uh, companies involved in this, so don't think that this was just one company. There was a consortium of companies doing this, uh, and one of these is going to appear a little bit later again. So Oksana, uh, myself, uh, Heather Raleigh, and Tatiana, one of the veterinarians in Russia who was involved with um, helping us interpret all of this data, we got on a Zoom call and we started looking at the meds and the information that was coming out from these scientific um, uh, visits that these guys had done. And from that, myself, Heather, and uh, one of the uh, activists and advocates in Russia, we put together this report. And it basically was all the stuff that the Russian scientists had said, but we had it in English. And then we took a whole lot of photographs and we started looking at the photographs in depth. So not just the, if you like, the quote unquote science of it, but the graphic images. And when I was doing that, I really noticed that, you know, the images could tell us some incredible stories without any other science, just looking at the pictures. And one of the things that I found was that if we did a match of one individual across 42 days, we could see a huge deterioration in that animal's welfare and how that animal was physically manifesting being kept in there. So if you talk about... Uh, Pseudomonas, or you talk about uh, E. coli or something like that, people's eyes glaze over. But you show them pictures of how these animals are deteriorating and you start to get a bit more of an impact, I've found anyway. So the left is a close-up of the bruising in the epidermis of one of the orca from the Russian whale jail. The other photo, it's not, it's not one of the Russian orca, it's one from New Zealand, but it shows you what it should look like. Okay, so this gives you a real comparison. And we put this sort of thing into this report. And what we found was that the media picked up on this. So that these scientists, people, have published images taken at intervals of 42 days. Now remember, these are not our images. These are images that the scientists have taken and the media. And then we, as well as Oksana, they all started asking for this, to get international experts in there to have a look. And so, as Ox Oksana explained, it happened. Um, and we have Jean-Michel, Katie, Jeff, uh, thank you, Harry, um, David, and Charles. And uh, they're outside the uh, embassy in Washington, D.C., Harry, uh, Charles? Yes, thank you. Um, and it almost looks like its own whale jail, right? <laughs> yeah, I find, found that quite ironic. Yeah, okay, interesting. Um, and I wasn't there because I was in New Zealand trying to get my own visa, um, which turned into be a huge fiasco, and uh, I ended up leaving New Zealand after these guys were already in Moscow. But we managed to join up. So this was the team. There was a Russian team, and then there was a USA team, and then there was me. Um, and so the guys underlined are our amazing translators who worked incredible hours, not only during the day translating for us, literally word for word as things were going on both ways, but also um, you'll see later how they helped um, with our, all our reports. And there was an impressive media fiasco um, as Charles will tell you, uh, over there. And um, there was a lot of interest, which was great because we wanted to raise the profile of what was going on. We wanted the international world to be watching. So off we went. I met up with everybody in Vladivostok. We went to what was 
um, euphemistically called the Centre for the Maintenance and Adaptation of Marine Mammals. If you want to interpret this, this actually means hold them and train them, ready to ship them to China. Okay, and this is it. This is inside the first layer of security. There were guys there with Kalashnikovs um, when we arrived. We were not allowed to film as we came in. We had to get special permission to take photographs. Um, and this is myself and Tatiana. And we're about to go into the second layer of gates. There's a third one after this. So there's three layers of gates to get to the animals. Um, and Oksana showed you pictures with the ice. This is what it was like when we arrived. Um, so we didn't have any ice problems. Um, in fact, in some points, it was actually really hot inside the little um, greenhouses where the orca were. Now, they kept the orca inside the greenhouses because um, it was too cold in the winter. They would have died from frostbite, as we saw with Kirill. And this is the facility from the hillside looking across. And here are these, these um, greenhouses where the orca are. And the first thing that Jeff and I gravitated to the moment that we walked in were these um, transport boxes. And we wanted to have a look at them. And thanks, Katie, for this photo of me, <laughs> or the back end of me, anyway. Um, and this is, this is what they are inside. Can you imagine being in there for seven days? Um, and the orca, one to a box, but the beluga, they were having up to five. Oh, oh yeah. And they're all pooping in there and peeing in there. It's, it's just criminal. Um, and so we each had a security guard, Russian security guard, with us that shadowed us everywhere we went. And we couldn't literally go to the toilet without one of them following us. We were watched with everything that we did. And in this case, I'm dropping in a hydrophone. And I, um, the guys were great. I mean, they were really, really nice guys, but they had a job to do. Um, and Katie took this amazing photo of what we saw when we first walked in with the orca. Absolutely bone chilling for me. Um, the animals were just floating there in the corner. They were pretty much doing nothing. Um, and here you can see the water's not disturbed as they're, they're just floating. They're not swimming around at all. And if we see this in a um, facility like SeaWorld, we label this immediately as stereotypic behaviours, right? Abnormal behaviours that have no obvious function. But once they realised that there was something new going on, different people doing really strange things, taking photographs, dropping in hydrophones, um, taking videos, Harry was climbing up and putting video cameras up high, all sorts of strange things going on. They became very, very animated and they were really interested in what was going on. And that was our first sign of hope. Because if the animals aren't broken, if they still have that mental spirit to survive, there was a chance for them. But we did see some really horrific behaviours um, where they were pushing up against the nets. And um, oh, this one was a little bit of glee and excitement, I think, trying to get our attention. At one point, um, I have a camera that is completely destroyed, but I keep it at home as, a, as a, a nice momentum because one of the orca breached right beside me and I was completely soaked in salt water. Um, yeah, so this is us trying to take pictures of them. Oh, and it took us a few days before they would actually allow us to come in and watch them um, feeding them. I don't quite know what they were trying to hide from us at that point, but once they started to let us, um, I mean, Charles and David um, were there for hours negotiating. You know, look, we came here all the way to actually observe the animals. We need to be able to see them being fed. We need to be able to take photographs. And, and every morning that we arrived, there was a renegotiation of whether we'd be able to get out there or not. So, you know, huge credit to those guys. Uh, and then we were eventually allowed to go in and see the fish prep rooms as well. Uh, and this is what it is, tubs and tubs and tubs of fish. I mean, when you've got basically 100 whales there, that's a lot of food to prepare every day. And when the feeding was happening, we were able to get up close and, and have a, bit of, a better look at um, their teeth, for example, um, their skin. And so you think, OK, the teeth look pretty good here. That's, that's great, good sign of um, the 
potential for these animals to be released. Because remember, that's what we were there for. We were looking at whether it would be feasible to get these animals back out there. Cookie cutter shark bites. We found a number of these. So you can see the black circle there. There's another one. Uh, and then this was some of the behaviours that I was talking about where they start pushing up against the nets. And it's a little bit hard to see in this, but the net is actually bowing in there where they're pushing so hard. There's net across the bottom too. They were going down and picking the nets up, hooking their teeth in them and lifting the nets up and seeing how far they could lift them up. I was very concerned about this because I thought, you know, there's potential there for the individuals to drown. They get their teeth hooked and they can't get their teeth out. Um, here again, you can see it. And these are really heavy nets, so they're pushing hard against this. Oh, there we go. So these wounds that you see between the teeth, this is from the net rubs, just rubbing and rubbing and rubbing as they're lifting the nets. Um, we were also trying to look for positive things. You know, what were they doing to keep these amazing animals mentally stimulated? And the whole time that we were there, this was it. This is all we saw. No other toys, no other mental stimulation. Um, they told us that they weren't training them, but then we saw training tools around the place, um, like balls on poles. And when one or two of us tried, when the, the guards weren't looking at us, a signal, the, the animals would respond to those. So sure enough, they had been trained, even if it was just basic stuff. We used GoPros, we used um, long lenses, short lenses, all sorts of things, and the animals just remained really interested in what we were doing. So again, this gave us some hope because if they'd only been interested for the first couple of minutes um, and then they went back to logging, then, then that would give an indication that you know, potentially mentally they were broken. But some of the things that we started to see were quite horrific. These are not drops of coffee on the whale. These are um, fungal probably. We, we weren't able to do biopsies on them and, and check, but they're certainly not normal. And so the, these little circles down here. And then all of this damaged tissue here. Um, a lot of it's subdermal from bruising. And uh, another example of some of the teeth up close. And here you can see all the skin peeling off. Yeah. Can you imagine how painful that is, right? I mean, their skin is super sensitive. It's more sensitive than ours. And then um, we found this broken tooth here. And that gives you a close-up look at it. Um, from the state of it, um, speaking to veterinarians, we believe that this had happened either during the capture, during the transport, or while the animal was uh, in the facility, we asked them were they treating it and they said no. So no painkillers, nothing. Yeah, can you imagine? Horrific. Um, and the belugas was no better. Um, I know that we're super pod and we focus primarily on the orca here, but I just did want to point out that these guys were suffering too. Remember I told you about the little grey ones? Don't forget that these had been in here for 18 months at this stage and yet they're still grey. So that shows just how young they were when they were taken, which is um, highly indicative that they were taken when they were lactating. And that was one of the laws that they broke when they captured these animals that ended up um, helping us to get them back out into the wild. So fungal again. Yeah, horrific, huh? So what we ended up doing each night, um, we would come back after getting our photographs and we would have a meeting and then we would say, okay, we need to get this down on paper. And so we would write some drafts and we preliminaries, then summaries and overviews and conclusions and assessments and recommendations and you can see it all, right? And the translators were translating this all night so the next morning we could hand documents out. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and then Charles was off talking to guys on the phone all the time or having meetings with them. He, he went off to the governor's house at one point. Um, you know, it was all go, nothing stopped. It was just full on the whole time that we were there. I'd say that we were doing somewhere between 20 to 22 hours every day that we were there. 
And the accumulation of this was a document that was drafted um, that had five paragraphs. So we have made the fundamental decision that our goal is to release the cetaceans back into their natural environment, paragraph one. And this was important, this was written in conjunction with the Russians, so there's a little bit of um, translation issues, but it's still pretty good when we get through this. Our goal is to release all of them. Scientists, including both Russian and international scientists from the Cousteau team, will continue to evaluate the animals to determine how to release them. So what we were saying was, we're here to help, we're gonna be there for these animals, we're gonna make sure that it's being done right. Okay, until then, we will immediately begin work so that the cetaceans are held in conditions most like their natural environment. Let's move them into a big sea pen so we can start the rehab process. That's effectively what we were saying here. We, will, we also expect that a rehabilitation centre will be created for those animals that are injured in the wild nature and that need to be rehabilitated. Pretty self-explanatory. We are working in a unified team towards this goal. It's brilliant, right? And it happened. So Jean-Michel and Charles and the governor signed this document. And it's one page in Russian and English, and it was historical. This was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so hats off to, the, to everybody that made this happen, right? It's really, really impressive. Okay, but Oh, and that was Jean-Michel and I, woohoo. <laughs> we were so excited. I think I had sore cheeks from smiling so much that day. Um, but it was not signed by the companies, right? And the companies, as Oksana explained, kept saying, these are our whales. We have a contract with the Chinese. We're not gonna release them. And eventually it got to the point where Putin said, you know what, I've said they're going back. They're going back. And so these guys pretty much had to um, kowtow to that. But in the meantime, we didn't give up with all our documents, so we had the preliminary assessments, 32 pages of this, and then translated into Russian as well, right? We had release plans, 66 pages. Um, and we talked about things like, you know, why transport them in these tiny little boxes? We know that orca have been transported in much bigger systems, so why can't we do something like this for the animals? We also said that once they arrive on site, one to two months of rehab will be required. Okay, and then we had to leave. So Katie and myself and Harry and um, a couple of the guards. This was our last day and off we left. So that was April 2019 and the animals remained in there. May, June, and it's worth keeping in mind that the perception of time for large animals that's been shown scientifically is not too dissimilar to ours, right? So they understand that there's this long period where they're in there. They've been in there for 18 months at this stage, right? It's pretty intense for these animals mentally as well as physically. And then of course, um, as Oksana explained, um, seven days. Now the nets at the front are so that if the animals go lethargic and st or start to go into to some sort of a problem, they can lift their heads out and help them. That's how bad it is for them that they, they require a way to lift the animals' heads up. And three belugas in a box at a minimum. All right, so Oksana's talked to you a lot about that release stuff, so I'm gonna just focus on a couple of things here. Don't worry about all the numbers, I just wanna point something out to you that this is from that 2021, um, from the same Russian team, but in 2021 they published this paper. And in here, when the orca arrived, they found six pathogens, so six diseases, bacteria, fungi, you know, whatever, six of them. Okay, and then just before they left, they checked them again. 31 pathogens from living in that toxic box of a sea pen at the whale jail. So this was an indication that it was not a good place to hold these animals, despite the fact that they were saying that this is a really great place for them and everything's good. Now, when they went to transport them, 
again, don't worry about the numbers because it's simple at the top here. There were five pathogens before transport. 21, uh, sorry, 12 from being in the box, just swimming in your own or someone else's poo. And then Oksana explained about um, Xena. And I thought it was really interesting to point out here that on, she was tagged and released on the 16th of July, and then she was recited on the 16th of August. But look at the tag. Can you see, this is, the tag has completely ripped off here at the top. So it's nearly ripped off at the bottom. So the tagging that they did, as much as it was really great for us to get good data, it was not in the best interests of the welfare of the animals, the way these animals were tagged. We um, saw the amazing footage that Oksana had of um, Gregory, who was of course there at the whale jail with us. Um, and he was there with the BBC and they filmed these orca and when they filmed them, they saw them feeding on marine mammals. So this again was affirmation that they had um, captured marine mammal munching orca. And I wanted to just point out as well that the tagging for the belugas is just horrific. I think it's even worse than what you see on the orca. Um, this is from the USA, uh, but it's the same concept that they were using. And this is what it looks like afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to read more about it, this is the paper, Ryan et al. 2022. Um, this animal died from the tagging. So when we think about how we're going to get this data, we really need to consider the individual welfare. It's all great for us to have a pretty picture of them moving around and know that they're doing okay out there, but there's got to be better ways. In this day and age, we've got to be able to come up with a better way to get this sort of data. Now, I mentioned to you earlier about one of the companies. Um, in 2019, while all this was going on, they started sending out emails and they were sending emails to the Norwegian government to ask if they could go there to capture whales. So although it's being shut down in Russia, we still have things to work on. We still have to look at better ways to tag these animals so that we can get the data when we do these releases. And we still need to make sure that these guys are not going in through the back doors. We know that they're also approaching African companies, uh, countries at the moment for these companies to go in there and uh, capture orca, but other cetaceans as well for the Chinese industry. So I'd like to think that um, the memories that these orca and belugas have of the whale jail are they're not a nightmare that they literally live through every day, that they slowly fade into the background for them and that they get the chance to, to live with their families for many, many more decades. Um, I think it's a remarkable thing that has happened. As Oksana pointed out, it's the largest release of cetaceans in the world. And um, in 2013, when I founded World Orca Day, I never thought that we'd get to the point that we would be celebrating something as really, really powerful as that. But I do hope that um, we keep having more of these celebrations. Some of them might be very small. Um, some of them might be giant. But um, I hope that we can all work towards making a better world for the captive orca and getting them back out into the wild. Thank you. Thank you.